and Christian Grammer from uh, UT Austin and Facebook AI Research with us today for the Bloomberg Learning Machine Seminar. Uh, Christian's work has been uh, recognized broadly, including with numerous uh, Best Papers Award and a Presidential Early Career Award uh, by uh, President Obama. Uh, Christian works uh, a lot in the intersection of computer vision and machine learning, and she's done foundational work. On, uh, image, on, on classifying image features and video summarization. And more recently, she has been working on uh, studying uh, visual reasoning in a, with embodied contexts, where you, are, you see, but, you, but in, along that you hear and you can act in an environment. So, uh, Kristen, thank you for joining us, and uh, let's welcome Kristen. Okay. Hi, everybody. To be here with you, and I'm very excited to show you some of our work. Um, the things I prepared today are quite recent, so things we've just been doing, just about to appear at CPR for the most part. Um, so that was a good intro to where I'm headed with this talk. I'm going to talk about embodied perception, new problems in vision that require us to think not just about static images, but video and agents that can do things in the world. And the theme today is going to be about anticipating the unseen and unheard, and you'll see how shortly. So let me just set the stage with this big picture motivation. I bet a slide or graphic like this is kind of familiar to a whole bunch of you in the room, but let me just tell you this big picture story. You know, we've had amazing success in computer vision in terms of what's possible for image recognition, right? Being able to take an image and label which of a thousand different categories does it belong to. And why did it happen so well so recently? Well, within the last six-ish years, all these ingredients came together in just the right way big hand-labeled data sets, deep learning, deeper networks, and GPUs. And so this made some really amazing results, like the ImageNet challenge, where the errors dropped much faster than we had expected some six years ago and kept on going from there. So this is amazing, um, but it's also not the end of the story. And so that's how I'm motivating here today. If you take something like the ImageNet challenge, which requires looking at an image and labeling the object, or if you take other similar kind of benchmarks that are in the 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 history of computer vision in the recent years for visual recognition, what you have is a set of photos that are downloaded from the web, maybe with keyword search, and then human pruned, and then they're put together so that you can train a system to know the difference between the categories. Furthermore, you give the system a new image and it, it, it can declare what category it is. Okay, so the point is these images actually already have some intelligence baked into them, right? And that's because a human took the photo. A human took the photo, it got online somehow, and then it made its way into our data set. And so in this way, these photos are really disembodied, right? They don't have a physical context. We just have a glimpse of them at this very special moment in time, and then this special spatial composition when a person decided to take the photo. So in that sense, it's smarter than we might even already give it credit for. And it's also quite different than what we face once we think about egocentric or first-person perception. So here, make that contrast, right? Here I'm showing you a video captured from a human's head-mounted camera while they do some daily life activity. And right away, we see there's a, there's a difference, right? It's not that well-curated moment in time. It's all moments in time. Some things are relevant. Some things are not so relevant. Furthermore, this is ongoing, right? We could play this video for hours from this first-person point of view. And in this case, the agent is, in, in fact, interacting with and changing the environment. The agent's also controlling where they look and how the camera moves. So all of those properties I just mentioned are important distinctions between web photo, computer vision, and egocentric perception. And we're trying to um, look at different elements of how to deal with this. Okay. So this is then the shift we'd like to see, um, going from the status quo of having disembodied snapshots towards computer vision and multi-sensory perception in the context of action and motion in the world. And of course, there's great developmental learning reasons why this could be possible or actually very necessary uh, as we see humans develop. But there's also just a need to have this if we want to be able to learn in unsupervised, self-supervised, weekly supervised ways just from first-person experience. Okay? And that will also let us touch into where perception can be helpful, most helpful for robotics. All right, so in today's talk then, the remainder, I'm going to show you some of our progress towards this big picture goal in terms of this theme of anticipation. Okay, and so the theme is going to be that for agents to learn through their experience in very lightly or unsupervised way, ways, uh, they can, we can pose tasks that can be described in terms of expectation or anticipation of what's next 
or what's where. So I'm going to show you three instances of this. The first one I'm going to talk about policies for learning how to look around a new environment. And here the anticipation is going to be that we see one part of an environment and we're trying to expect what everything else would look like. So from top to bottom here. Okay. So I'll spend a good amount of detail on this section and then I'll move into the second thread talking about affordance learning. And here, this is an important problem for embodied perception because we're talking about objects, not just how they look, but how we would use them if we were the first person agents. And so here the anticipation is going to be, we need agents that can look at a static object at rest, like the microwave on top, and expect the actions that are possible without seeing them happen with that instance. And then finally, I'll talk briefly at the end about some of our work in audiovisual learning, where most recently we're looking at how can you anticipate sounds you haven't heard, in particular, lift monaural audio to binaural audio. Okay. So three parts, and I'll start right now looking at the look around policy. Okay, so in active perception, we move from learning representations or encodings of images towards learning policies or behaviors about how our agents, in our case, should move around an environment or manipulate an object. And of course, this is a problem with a very rich history in the literature. Um, including between computer vision and robotics and broader AI. However, in the world of internet, computer vision has been sort of quiet in recent years. So what we can look at first, um, just to set the stage a little bit more, we can look at first here is the problem of active recognition. And this is the problem where you have an agent who's encountered an object or scene and needs to recognize it. But it doesn't have to limit itself to just one snapshot, right? It has the power to either move around in that scene and get a better view, or maybe manipulate the object to get a better view. So in active recognition, we would like a policy in the reinforcement learning sense that will prescribe the sequential behavior to take in camera motion such that the recognition problem succeeds. And when we started looking at this problem, we were building on some of our early wor earlier work on anticipating how things look when we move in different ways, to build a so-called end-to-end approach in which we would have a perception module that can look at the current view together with uh, an action selection module that would intelligently choose the motion to take. And then finally, a evidence fusion module that would aggregate this evidence as it kept, came in sequence. So this is a recurrent loop where at every point in time we get an observation, which is the current view, um, next make an action, which is how to move the object, and then aggregate over time. And we tackled this um, in an end-to-end -end manner. We had a string of networks together, a recurrent network for the evidence fusion, um, a convolutional neural network for the perception, and a stochastic neural network for the action selection. And you can imagine in my cartoon how now if the agent can move that mug to the view that's disambiguating, we get the answer right quickly, right? And the reward to train up the system, importantly, is category specific. So it knows about some N objects in the world and it learns a policy that will make motions that disambiguate those N objects. Okay, so this, this is a task specific um, policy that we could learn to do active recognition. Now, let me just give you one visual example of this at work, where we took this data set called germs, where a robot arm, that's what this crazy looking thing is right here, holding a toy object, it's a germ-shaped toy, um, has to decide, you know, where will we move the arm next such that it's clear what object it is. There's 130-ish of these objects. So in the first view, we're getting it wrong. So from that first perception input, it's wrong. So we choose an arm motion to look at a slightly different viewpoint. And in fact, it's still wrong. And after three glimpses, each of them intelligently chosen, the agent finally now has the right answer. So the point is, in active recognition, you've learned a policy where those three were the right three to get you the answer quickly. So yes. this, is, this is a classification of 136 objects? That's right. And they're all these kind of like dolls? They're all similar. So it's fine grain in that, you know, another germ, you can see how these two germs look similar. And um, that's, that's what makes it a good because if I had um, 130 very different looking things, you could probably take any view and succeed. But the point is, there is a good view that will help disambiguate, like maybe the bow tie on that germ is the identifying factor. Yeah. Okay. All right, so this was a task-specific policy. Now let's get to this idea of a look-around policy that's anticipating 
um, where to look for the best information. Okay, so let me contrast what I just showed you very briefly, which was recognition, task is predefined. Get the agent in the room, it needs to recognize which germ it is. But there's plenty of scenarios where we'd like to have agents that can enter a new environment, be smart about how to look around, but not necessarily in a very task-specific manner yet. Right, so think search and rescue or some information gathering mission where the autonomous agent will need to move its own camera, but the task is still unfolding dynamically. So this is the contrast we want to start pushing towards. And the question then is, could we learn a look around policy that will allow the agent to be exploratory, intelligent, but also exploratory? So is that contrast clear? Kind of task specific recognition now, task independent, look around policy. How are you going to get your new, your new observations in a task agnostic way? <clears throat> so here's the main idea for how we tackle it. We consider an objective based on completion or reconstruction. So the idea is we'd like the agent to enter this new environment and choose the sequence of glimpses that in aggregate will be strongly predictive of all the glimpses that it did not make. Okay, so learn a policy where you can efficiently infer all the things you haven't yet directly observed. So if you think of an agent, for now, let's think of an agent standing here in the environment with a narrow field of view camera, and it's made some series of glimpses already in the 3D environment. And the question is then, what should be our next view? How should we next turn that camera? Now, we pose this in terms of choosing the views that will most complete the entire scene. And in my cartoon here, you can get some intuition for why that might be a good idea. Because if I were to turn the camera towards this view, well, maybe it's already very highly anticipated based on what's seen nearby. The tree, maybe it's near a bench, or the boat, maybe it's near the water. Whereas there's going to be other parts of the scene that from the glimpses we have already, we just don't know. Those would be, intuitively, those are going to be the ones that are information rich. So this is the problem statement and a hint of our solution, which is going to be based on optimizing for completion. Now, I want to contrast this problem statement with another thing you might think of once I show you visuals like that, like this, and that's um, saliency or attention. Right? We could have models for saliency or attention, but the difference in the problem here is saliency, we would expect that we look everywhere and then we prioritize. Some things are more important than others. Here, we have to decide that it's important to look somewhere before we actually look there. So that's the difference in the task. So let me say a little bit more about how we implement this idea of active, sequential observation gathering in a visual environment. So we proposed an encoder-decoder mm -hmm. network that will first, as the, as the centerpiece, will know how to lift a single view or end views in sequence to all possible views. Okay, so it looks like this. We have a, in this example here, I'm showing you a single input view. And so we have some encoder network. We also have as input some proprioception knowledge. So here we know gravity. We don't know the orientation of the agent in the world, but we know about gravity. So we have an elevation sensor. And then we'll fuse these two inputs and have a decoder part of the network that goes back from this latent encoding to um, in fact, a view grid that we can visualize and in which we can express the loss. So single view in, encode, decode, and the target output is to go from that single view to this full uh, environment view. And what I'm showing you here is an equirectangular projection of a 360 image. Okay, so it's just a spherical image squashed down into 2D. And this would be an example of a reconstruction that the agent could learn to construct from that single input view. And during training, we know the full environments. So this is what we're training against some, um, in fact, some shifted version of a loss between these two images, what we're reconstructing and what we should be reconstructing. Okay, so that's an element then that allows us to do this lifting from anticipating what we do see to what we might see everywhere else. Okay. Now, let's build on that just one step further to make it a sequential ac um, active view selection process. So again, I have a sequence of views so far. I have that encoder model I just showed you, and a current belief, which is that view grid, that noisy view grid I showed you on the bottom right. Okay. And that view grid, just to be a little more precise, is indexed by the elevation and azimuth angles here in my 360 view. 
Okay, so that's what we just saw. So now let me add the recurrence and the action selection part to this. We'll need to have an actor model uh, that selects those camera motions that will best improve the reconstruction error for this full view grid. And so in other words, the RL um, agent is learning guided by a reward, which is fast completion of the full environment. Now, as you mentioned, this is non-myopic in the sense we're going to train these policies for a given budget length, so T glimpses, like in my mini robot arm example, T was three, it knew to make three glimpses and then declare. So similarly here, we'll train to some budget of time, uh, and, and in, in this way, we can ask for policies that are non-myopic, just to contrast that with nest contrast that with next best view, right, which would be always a greedy selection of the next thing to observe. All right, so this is the basic model. Let me show you now um, ways in which we can explore how useful it, it could be. And there's two scenarios we look at. They're kind of duals of each other. So the first one um, is the one we've been looking at, which is you have an agent looking out, and it needs to look out in different directions. Uh, and that we've been able to test with 360 imagery where you take carve out a virtual narrow field of view uh, over time in the sphere. The other scenario, think of the inverse. Think of the agent looking in. And so this for us would represent the agent looking at an object that it's allowed to turn around. Um, so agent camera views coming in over time. And for this, we can use 3D model data sets like ModelNet, ShapeNet, for which we can render the object at any direction. So two scenarios. We tested these both with data sets like I just mentioned, the 360, we use Sun360 uh, for the 3D object here I'm showing model net. Now let us first look at results to see, can we learn an active policy that will do reconstruction fast? We'll do completion fast. So there's three different data sets here. We're going to look at error on this axis and time on this axis. And first here are a bunch of baselines, things you could do if you just took the first view and stopped, usually not recommended, um, or if you took a random policy. So you just need some random motions to collect new information. Or if you did things like take the largest action possible, or cheat and run saliency everywhere and then take the most salient region. Okay. Now compared to all of those, we see um, a sharper drop in accuracy uh, error over time uh, in reconstruction and environment. So it has indeed learned a policy where it's smart about where to put the camera to reconstruct all the pixels in the full environment. So this checks out. And in fact, it's trained to do this. So this is, this is what we want. One of the exciting things about this set of results, though, for us was that we could do this on unseen objects. Right? So I motivate it in terms of, well, if it has to be one of n objects, this is somewhat limiting. We need agents that can look at new things. And so one way in which we're testing this is train on a certain set of object categories, airplanes, desks, bookcases, whatever, and then also test if it can generalize to intelligently look around a novel object that wasn't observed during training. Okay, not a novel instance, a novel category of object. And that's what you're seeing on the right-hand plot. Okay. Yes? Quick question. So if you go back to the previous slide, yeah. so I'm not really familiar with the, with the model net. I think I know something. Yeah. So the yeah. numbers actually, the scales of, of the errors are very different between Right. Them. Is it model is model net much a simpler environment? It is. So model net, um, we'll see some pictures shortly, and you'll see that they are simpler visually. Uh, Sun is real 360 images captured. Uh, model net is 3D cat objects with some lighting and shading just rendered. Yeah. So that that agrees with that there. So here are some examples from the Sun 360. What you're seeing on the very left are the ground truth 360 spherical images. Again, micro rectangular projection. And then in the middle, you're seeing, looks like about five glimpses that the agent took in some sequence. This is the active selection of what it wanted to look at. And on the right, then, is the reconstruction after those five-ish glimpses. And so the more similar it looks to the image on the left column, the better it's done. And you'll see that even when glimpsing about 15% of the pixels, it has a hypothesis about how everything else would look. I mean, in fact, we can see that a little bit over time. Um, same data set, now let's just look at that over time. Um, through this reconstruction. So here's what it chose to see. Here's the reconstruction, now an eco rectangular projection. And then here is just a little walkthrough from the egocentric point of view on the bottom right of what we think we see. And this is meant to give you a more sense of the, the camera motion within the 360 sphere. 
right? Because when we see them like this, we tend to think of them as a 2D scene. But it's really, it can look up and down and behind um, within the 360 view. And then this is how the reconstruction looks. So you can see some are harder than others. So if you think about outdoor scenes with smoother things, as you can imagine, kind of completion tends to be easier. Textured indoor rooms um, can be more surprising and harder to reconstruct. And in fact, that's exactly why you want this intelligent look around behavior, right? To point your camera in the places where the most information is needed. Um, we can look at this also uh, for that other case of objects. And here's, you have where you see the model and objects, where here in the first view, it sees the top of a bookcase. It may have selected an intelligent action to look down and then around, and all of a sudden it sees um, spaces in the object which allow it to reconstruct better over the full view grid over time. So again, that's just replaying. On the left is how it's looking at the object. On the right is its internal belief in pixel space about the full object. Okay. Now, what I've shown you so far is that we can learn policies that learn to quickly look around and get high accuracy and completion. Now, where we need to go from here is to back up that goal of generalizing in a, this task agnostic policy to do useful active perception. So by that, I mean we would like to be able to take what I just showed you, which is an unsupervised way to build up a movement policy for a visual environment, <clears throat> and see if we can use that to prepare an agent or let an agent execute a specific active perception task. <clears throat> so the very thing, first thing I opened with today, the robot arm, learning about objects, that was this world where there was a task-specific um, policy, learn to do active recognition. And so now what I'm asking is, can we take what I just showed you, which was this look-around policy, and kind of plug it into the supervised task? One way to think about this is pre-training. It's like we're pre-training a policy, right? We often think of pre-training representations. Maybe we pre-train on ImageNet, if you're familiar, and then it lets us do things on Coco for detection. Um, here I'm talking about pre-training a policy so that's learned in this look around manner and now I run it when doing a, a specific task like recognition. I think I saw a question, yeah. yeah question. So when it decides, uh, intuition wise, like when it decides where to look next, does it go um, somewhere where it's most unsure what this area looks like or does it go somewhere where it decides going there makes me learn faster what it is or is it exactly the same? Ah uh, yeah, it's the first and plus a little more. So it's the first in that it's, when we learn our policy on this side, it doesn't yet know about a recognition task. So it doesn't know about names of objects. It just knows about visual reconstruction, like imagining pixels. And so, and so it is the first in that it goes to where it's most uncertain. It's a little more nuanced because it is non-myopic. And so, um, you know, there's some neighborhood of camera motions that are allowed at each time period. You can't just teleport around. And so you can imagine an agent with a long-term policy that might you know, the next view it selects might already be certain, but it's needed to go there, for example, to get upstairs in the house to find the other part. So, yeah. Okay, so this is the, the uh, policy transfer we want to attempt. Okay, and I'm going to show you first for recognition, where we took the data sets I was showing you before, and now we drop in our policy to see, does it help to do active perception when evaluated for recognition? And so these are standard active recognition curves. Now it's accuracy. So high is good over time. And these are baselines like we saw before, like not looking anywhere else, being random. Um, the green, though, is the supervised task-specific policy, and the purple is ours, which is that look around uh, unsupervised, visually trained policy. And the great thing is these are actually rather competitive. Okay, so the one trained in a very hand-supervised manner, ours trained in just based on reconstruction, and we get um, nearly as good active perception from it. So the transfer did happen. Now that's active recognition. We've also looked at not just this task, but a suite of tasks. And I won't go into details on each of these, but things like, can we use the look around policy to benefit pose estimation, or light source localization, or even estimating the volume of the object? All things you'd like to do with small amounts of glimpses, um, and we have results showing that these things can all transfer quite well from this look around policy. Now, most recently, we're also looking at how to generalize our results and our implementation to full 3D environments. 
So what I just showed you, that the environments were 360, but I could only rotate the camera, right? I couldn't translate it. Um, but if we move into 3D environments, like the Matterport 3D that I'm showing here, then we can do full motion of the camera. And so the video I'm showing you is a, an internal result from our current approach, where it's tasked with finding the thing in the middle, the red box, in this house. And then on the right, you're seeing like a ground plane map of where the target actually is in red and where we are in green. And so it's in fast forward motion, showing you the egocentric views that it's taking as it rapidly navigates to the target point, as expressed through the middle photo. Okay. So all I've talked about so far is this look around policy idea that is all based on anticipating unseen parts of the environment. And in fact, completion, another way to say it is completion, right? We want to be able to complete pixels for, from pixels we've seen, complete the ones we haven't seen. Just as a brief um, aside hanging off of that, I wanted to highlight two things briefly in about um, three slides. So based on this idea of completion, most recently we've also been looking at um, solving for pose between two RGBD scans. So RGB plus depth. And where completion fits into here is that we realize if we have extreme pose estimation, which just means there could be little to no overlap between the two scans, so two RGBD scans, but they may not overlap, then we want to be able to still register them, solve for the rotation and translation between them. And completion plays a role because our idea was to infer the completed cube map, it's another 360 encoding, for each of the scans such that even though they didn't overlap originally, we have something to go on, right, to solve for that registration. Okay, so you have very far separated views, and they may not overlap in space, but if you can complete their spheres, now you can have something internally for the algorithm to match better. So we have a, a process to iterate between doing this cube map completion and the matching. And we're getting some good results um, on some standard data sets like SunCG, Matterport, ScanNet, where in this in this column I'm showing or this row I'm showing the ground truth registration of two RGBD scans, so two parts of the room, and then in green and red here I'm showing how we registered those two scans for these three examples, despite the fact that they may have little to no overlap. Again, just benefiting from this hallucination of parts of the scenes that weren't observed in the original input. Furthermore, we realized that the agents or robots don't, aren't the only ones with look-around problems. We have it too when watching a 360 video. So you may watch a 360 video on a headset and try to figure out where's the good stuff. Similarly, you might be on a YouTube display and try to click around like this user is to find the interesting stuff. Um, so this is a look-around problem as well. And we um, have a system that will address it and hypothesize virtual camera paths through the 360 sphere. The input is on the left, the output is on the right, and it's choosing basically where to look over time so you can watch a natural looking 2D video and not miss the good stuff. <coughs> okay, so here we are. I talked to you about the look around policies, anticipating the full environment to learn how to look. Now I want to shift into talking about anticipation of action. And again, this is strongly motivated from having embodied perceptual agents, where it's not enough to look at a picture of an object and declare what it is. I mean, that's part of the story. Um, but beyond the fact that it's a lamp, we want agents that know how to interact with objects. And so it should be able to look at objects and expect the actions that are possible. Like, I could turn it on, I could move it, I could replace the bulb, and in fact, even expect the spatial regions where this is true. Here it's toggleable, here it's adjustable. And so this is the classic notion of affordances, the possibility of action for an object. Okay, so how are we going to represent and make such uh, predictions? If you look at current approaches, they take a very reasonable pipeline that's supervised, right? So how it's supervised? Well, people will take images of objects and then write down regions where these affordances exist. So you could ask someone to label all the holdable regions on the book. And then you could treat this as what's called a semantic segmentation problem. You know, learn a function that knows how to take an image and reproduce region labels like this that say where something's holdable. So it'll capture their expectation of what's important. 
But here's the thing. How is a book holdable? Turns out a book is holdable in a whole lot of ways. So here's just some YouTube videos demonstrating that. And it's, it's quite nuanced, right? So it's um, perhaps not something we can directly steer into hand-drawn annotations and then try to reproduce with semantic segmentation. In fact, this book is holdable and movable in the different ways these people are, are doing. So, so the, the idea then for us was to see if we could move from manually curated affordances to um, an embodied or pseudo-embodied version of how to learn this by watching people, including from first-person video, do these interactions with objects, such that we might get more refined and even more grounded um, representations of how interactions happen with objects. Okay, so we'll move from here to here. And you can think of this as the couch potato version of learning uh, human object interaction by just watching them unfold, including from this first person spec perspective like you see down in the right. All right, so the goal is going to be to predict affordances and new content, whether images or video. And the idea is to do so by learning from weekly labeled video of human doing, humans doing these things. So let me say a bit about the approach. So as tra at training time, we tr start by training an action recognition engine. So here we have a recurrent neural network called LSTM that will take a strip of video over time this is a training video for which we know an action that's taking place. Like here, the person is doing an opening action. And we'll, we'll learn um, in this recurrent network how to um, predict the open action from video. Okay. Now, at this point, we have action recognition in hand. But now here's the key. We'll look at um, the aggregated state from this representation, this action model. So there's some features that have been learned, some encoding in this sequential model. And think of those features at the end of this action. So they represent what, what was in the video that made this action. And now we'll take that representation and treat it as a target for what we would like to anticipate for an object at rest. Okay, so learn the actions here, open, pull, press, whichever. And then up here, let's train a model that can look at a, even a static photo of an object at rest, not being interacted with, and let it be predictive of that action state from the learned action model. So the model here, this is a convolutional neural network, let's call it an anticipation network, that goes from an object at rest to be predictive of the video state of the object when it would be opened. Okay. So if you're familiar with network distillation, you can think of that this as an instance of it, right? Where you're trying to distill from the feature space that came out of this guy, but map it from static photos of the object at rest. Okay. So, okay, so at that point we have a model that can take a static photo and anticipate how this, the features that might come about if the action of was being um, employed. And then the final step is to indicate spatial regions where this action could happen. And so for this, I've got the same picture from before. So here we were, this picture, now it's still there and there's still that same anticipation network. And what we'll do is use um, activation maximization techniques to map back to those regions of the object at rest image that are most responsible for uh, getting this action. Right? So if you think of GradCam and similar techniques, we're looking for the parts of the features in this input image that are most responsible for the afforded action. So what have we done? Learned from video about how people use objects for different, some array of verbs. Here I've touched on pullable or openable. And now allow to back project to a source image to know which regions might afford that action, even before it happens. Now, just to be clear, you might say, well, is this, is this just action recognition? Because we know how to train models to recognize actions. We know how to do grad cam and find out which features were most responsible. Um, and it's not. And it's, the reason why is because of that anticipation step. So if we just did action recognition, action, learn an action classifier with an LCM, and then look back at the activated features, we'll get maps that look like this on these objects. Whereas if we do it with the method I just mentioned, 
they're going to be much more localized and focused on the regions of the objects specifically that suggest that action. Okay. Question on this before I move on to the results? Good. Yes? Um, I just have a partial question. Is there any uh, combination with the look around policy going on? For example, the reading the book, right? Maybe if there was a look around happening, only read the book and bed a certain way. Yeah, yeah. It's not happening here, but it sounds very interesting, right? Yeah, I think these things could eventually come together once you have the agent doing afforded action reasoning as well as deciding where to look. Or maybe one great one would, in this vein would be to, um, you know, how should I move around the lamp to tell if it's uh, toggleable, right? But these, right now, they're, these are separated uh, ideas, yeah, that we've tried. Right. Yeah, yeah. So how do you get the, the <clears throat> so you have videos and you need to, you need to somehow annotate them with the object at rest? Or, mm. or you yeah. grab this from the video? Right, we did. So two different ways. So actually, I'll talk about it on this data set side. So um, in one data set, the Epic Kitchens is this first person video and it's labeled for actions. And in fact, we use those labels and it's temporally localized. So you know when the action began and ended. Um, and so then you can back off of that to, to get the object at rest frame for training. Um, and others, this is a data set from Stanford called Oprah, where it's YouTube videos of people instructing you how to use a different appliance. And then you have separate catalog photos, the ones like I was just showing you, of the, cat of the, photo of the object at rest, because it's the one on the Amazon or whatever where you could buy it. And that's where these two sources come from. So we try with these data sets, and I'll show you a result on Coco in just a moment. And the idea is to train on the video data sets and then generate the heat maps, these what we call hotspots or interaction hotspots on new images and even from unseen categories. So I'm stressing that because what we really want our agents to be able to do is to experience and anticipate opening actions <coughs> on this kind of door and that kind of door and then encounter a new object where even though we haven't trained for dishwashers, say, it's still expectable where that thing could be open. So let me show you then um, a quantitative evaluation first on this part, which is, remember my book motivation, you know, can we learn, how well can we learn how to localize afforded action regions on a novel image? So how good are these hotspots? And so what we did is we compared ours, which is this row next, uh, right here, to, on the top, a bunch of weekly supervised methods. So methods that have learned to do egocentric gaze estimation or saliency or even just taking a center bias. Um, based on this first person view, as well as strongly supervised methods. So methods that trained in the way I just described earlier, where you're, you're shown where the key points would be during training and you try to reproduce that. And so the good thing, first of all, on this table is that we're doing much better than these other weekly supervised approaches on both data sets. And we're, you know, getting to be competitive, not quite there yet, but pretty competitive with um, these supervised, strongly supervised methods. Now, what do they look like? Um, let me show you just one video example. When I play this, what we're going to see is on the left, the yellow shading for saliency as predicted with a recent um, egocentric gaze prediction model. And then on the right, it'll show our hotspots separated out by four of the, I believe there's some 30 different actions in there. So these are four of the most frequent. And so these will be color coded for red cuttable, green mixable, blue holdable, and so on. And I'll show the hotspot regions we think. Here, we're just processing each frame over time. Okay. So the thing to notice is, first of all, it's factored out by afforded action. So CNC will find salient regions, and then the hotspot maps on the right are dividing them out according to the actions that are expect expected to be possible. Um, and furthermore, as I said, this is tested in, in a generalization manner, meaning we haven't seen all the objects that are cuttable, but it'll ex it's learned the visual cues that are um, able to generalize for cuttable regions. <clears throat> now the final result, and to me maybe the most exciting one that's coming from this work, is to look at how understanding of object function can help recognition. Okay, so if, you, if we really believe for the embodied perception um, tools to be important for traditional tasks like recognition, then this is a great place to test it. In fact, it's known that humans can recognize objects better if they understand their function. 
imagine yourself in someone's kitchen who has like every cooking device imaginable. You haven't seen that particular spatula, but you've already you can recognize it if you understand how spatulas work. Okay. So that's exactly the kind of test we posed here, where we looked at this um, popular object detection benchmark called COCO. It has images like these. And we considered the low shot case. So just meaning we have small amounts of labeled training examples for the different object categories. And not, now we not only encode them in terms of the visual features, but we also encode them in terms of these interact, grounded interaction hotspot features. Okay. So think of then some two-stream network that takes both of these things and then does object recognition. And though still small, there's an encouraging bump in accuracy for this low shot task just simply because the system knows not only how objects look, but also how they function. Okay, so understanding the interaction helps here in the low shot case for object recognition. <clears throat> okay, so from here, um, and then um, in the last part of the talk, uh, I'll, I'll move on to look at audio visual. So just to recap what we've seen so far, I talked about policies to have agents that can enter new environments, see new objects, and move the camera efficiently so that it gets good information. And I even showed how that could generalize to new tasks. Just now, we talked about affordance learning, where the anticipation problem was to look at objects at rest and expect how they could be used. And I showed how we can learn from video to create such hotspot heat maps in new images or video, and that it could possibly start to help us with recognition. So the third and final, I'm also going to continue this anticipation theme, but now we're looking at audiovisual learning. Okay. And um, to set the stage, you know, if we think about the disembodied visual recognition world, then you know, we're disembodied, we don't even hear, we just think of objects as static entities that are silent sitting in our images. When of course objects are not all silent, they're noise makers, sound makers, and it's part of the perception of these objects in the world to understand both how they look and how they sound. So we ought to be listening to learn as well. And the goal here that I'll start with is to be able to have a repertoire of objects and the sounds they make. Okay. What's hard to do this, even with very strong machine learning tools, is the fact that objects don't exhibit their sounds one at a time in video. Right? We might have an image of a dog and then an image of a cat nicely separate out, but we don't always have um, single, what are, single audio source video examples to learn from. We have to be able to train from video in which a single audio channel has mixed into it multiple object sounds. So that's the challenge. And when we started looking in this direction, um, the first thing we wanted to do is to recover these sound models from video data and demonstrate how well they were recovered by performing audio source separation. Okay, so we could learn to separate the object sounds. And the key was, again, that we would do this learning from unlabeled video, not separated sound sources, but just unlabeled video that may have multiple objects present per video, and then disentangle here um, the sound, here's some representation of the spectrogram, some, that, some sound basis functions that go with each different object category. And of course, a key ingredient is that we have the visual data, and so we can look at the objects in the video during training and start to do this disentangling, right? So sometimes the dogs with the cello, just go with it. Sometimes the dogs with dishes in the background. And once you've seen all these different pairings, and you can visually see them as well, hear and see them, then you can start to learn this in disentangling. And our initial model for this was a deep multi-instance learning approach to get there. And then we applied it for separation. I'm going to show you some of those separation results now, um, where I'll show you, you know, we train on 100,000 unlabeled videos, <coughs> multi-source videos, and then we separate the different sound makers. So first I'll play the input video, and then I'll play the separated audio tracks that we've discovered for this new test video. So here we go. Here's the original. Okay, and now here's the first separated soundtrack for violin. And guitar. Okay, and we've tested with all kinds of instruments because they're nice and that they play a lot together, but also vehicles, street scenes, 
um, and animals. Here's a little good combo for that. First video. <laughs> what we take out for the dog. And the violin. This is that's really just a teaser for some of that earlier work we did for audio, uh, visually guided audio source separation, where our main contribution is really to show how we could start to learn such a model from unlabeled video. Now, what I wanted to close with today in our theme for um, anticipation is the following. We're starting to look at um, not just the semantics that we could learn from audio combined with the visual, but also the spatial information we could learn from it. And indeed, there is strong spatial information and in sound when you're embodied and you have two microphones like we do here. And so from, you know, because we are hearing sounds from our two ears with their spacing and the shape of our ears, we get different effects like the interaural time difference or level difference where the time at which a certain sound reaches one ear versus the ear that's further away is a signal about spatial information as well as um, some dampening that happens uh, because the head is there blocking the sound a little bit on the further side, some shadowing. And these are spatial effects that are quite strong and in informative about localizing things in the world from our sound source. And yet, if you look at methods like the one I just showed you in our work or others, we're often working with um, just monaural audio, right? some, some audio track that we have, single channel audio. And those spatial effects are, at the surface, absent. So here's the idea. We would like to go from monaural audio recordings, which are prevalent, to binaural audio recordings, one in which we have the soundtrack with those time delays and level differences for the left and the right ear. And this is indeed a inferring the unheard kind of problem because this would require lifting from what is a flat, spatially deprived monaural audio signal into this spatially rich binaural tracks. Okay. So in this way, we could try to learn the thing. Of course, our key ingredient will be the visual context, which is also spatially rich with information about where objects are and where sounds might be coming from. Okay. So the idea that we're attempting is to take video uh, and learn how to lift monaural audio into the binaural con uh, counterpart through the visual data. And in a nutshell, the method works like this. During training, we have both, both uh, tracks, the left and the right ear, for some binaural recordings. That we can collapse into the monaural audio. And here is some encoding. Here's a spectrogram capturing this, the frequencies of the sounds over time, as well as we have the visual frame. So in training, we have binaural audio and the video over time. And from this, we learn, we have a, a, a network we've devised. There's like a UNET architecture to it to combine both the sound and the visual in order to produce the desired binaural audio as output. Okay, and like the other things I've been showing today, this has a self-supervised element to it, right? Or at least unsupervised in that <clears throat> we have unlabeled video is fair game, so long as we have binaural audio with it to train. And now when we test on this model, of course, we'll have only the monaural audio and we'll lift it to the binaural through the video. Okay. So to do this work, we got started last summer and we collected first a data set. So um, binaural audio is not so prevalent and part of the reason we wish to be able to even generate this immersive 3D sound. And so at Facebook, um, we, we constructed this rig which has off-the-shelf components. So this 3D IO mi uh, binaural microphone has two ear, outer ear shapes like this and the two microphones with approximate head width uh, distance between them. And we also connected a GoPro for the eyes above, as well as a monaural microphone. And then we collected in a music room, a large mu music room like this that has, you know, a dozen instruments in there and had various people volunteer to come through and play with different levels of skill um, because some of, some, you know, non-musicians, why not? This is unsupervised. We're going to learn the final sound. And for about six hours. And lots of skilled musicians. I should say the most skilled, the unskilled I'm talking about my students who were in there <laughs> to do it as well, just to be clear. All right, so we have this data to train with. And furthermore, in the meantime, some nice data came um, prepared in this NIST work, which consists of some 360 videos from YouTube along with Ambisonics. So full 360 audio that you can convert to the binaural. Okay. So 
So we're training, uh, training and testing on both these kind of data sets, the music stuff, there's Rohan, the key author on this work, um, and this YouTube data. So I can show you this result, but really if you want to experience it, you'd have to go to our webpage and listen to it with headphones, because you want the, do, the two tracks that we're producing to reach your ears in the intended manner. All right, but we'll listen to it now, um, and then if you're interested, hear the binaural sounds uh, offline by going to this link. Okay, so the input is a video with the monoral audio. Okay. And then we infer the binaural, and again, you won't really hear it right in this room. But you can see the, the binaural tracks we've inferred on the bottom. Uh, and then the ground truth will be there as well. Here's an um, example from one of those 360 data sets, monoral. I'm lifted to binaural, which I don't think you can hear in this room, am I right? I couldn't earlier. Yeah. So if you're interested, do the headphones at home to hear the difference here. So now since we know the held out binaural sound for this data, we can evaluate quantitatively with a variety of different metrics how well we're inferring it. Uh, and we do this against a variety of baselines, including what if we just had the audio? What if we flipped the visual because that shouldn't work? What if we just duplicated the monaural twice? Um, and across these, we're getting quite good results. Furthermore, we ran a user study. So we wanted to know if you experienced the binaural audio that we inferred, is it immersive and 3D and spatialized to the point where you could listen to it and tell us where the violin was coming from? That was one of the tests we did. Uh, and then the other one, we just asked people to compare the ground truth binaural to one produced by some method and um, say which ones were correct or which ones were better. And those are the two things we were studying with the users at the bottom here. And furthermore, though I'm not going to show it here, we could show that this Binauralization task is a good self-supervised so-called proxy task to allow us to do better separation, which actually makes a lot of sense because there's strong spatial components you need for separation as well, right? To be able to start paying it like the cocktail party, start paying attention over here, or over here, you want to know where the sounds are coming from. Okay. So this is um, going to conclude the talk. I've talked about policy learning, anticipating how the environment would look, object affordance learning, anticipating how they would be used, and now briefly, uh, audio spatialization, where we anticipate how things would sound from multiple directions. And so these are the themes today, and the amazing students who did all the work I talked to you about today, Rohan, Tushar, Dinesh, and Santos. And I'll stop here and be really glad to have any questions. Example. So you started off with like separating um, two sound sources. So for example, the piano and the guitar. Um, was the goal in the end to basically say, okay, that the piano is playing on the right and the guitar on the left, or is the goal to say this is the piano and this is the point in space, and depending on where it is in space, I it reaches my ears the, like the following way. Right. Yeah. So. Both of those pieces are there. So the first part that I went most briefly over is just the separation, meaning the right answer is to take the soundtrack in and give piano on one track and whatever the other instrument on the other track. So just separating. The spatialization comes in with the binaural part, where we aren't explicitly what we're what we're left with is the implicit encoding of spatial information through the binaural soundtracks. Just as we get the 3D sound of, you know, if someone claps over in that corner and I hear it over there, that's encoded in the differences between those two, the red and blue waveforms that meet my ears. And that, that is exactly what we're estimating. Now, where they came together, or where they can come together, and we have some early results, is that the, because both separation and spatialization, the binauralization, do um, benefit from spatial cues, then, say, the representations we learn from binauralization can allow us to do better separation. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. okay. But in the end, is it like exactly in space? Do I know exactly where it is in space? Or is it more like right on the end? Not from our technique, right. Yeah, I mean, you, it's because what we're producing is sound. 
Um, but um, at least in a supervised way, if, um, if not better, you could map from that to space, right? Because people can, right? We can hear and have you know, at least directionality for the sound from the, those waveforms that we're producing. Yes? I have a question. This was a very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, in the first project with autonomously directed camera, so did you find a pattern which images or where the, where the robot places the camera, or do you also see, so what is the starting point? What is the first image? Yeah. And, and, and do you see yeah. patterns maybe beach images are just always from left to right? Or? Right, right. Yeah, we've looked at this a bit, and the starting point is random, as in we want it to start at different azimuth angles or positions um, so that we don't learn anything sensitive to the starting point. And so that's how it tests, how it's tested. As far as patterns, we've looked pretty hard. This itself seems to be a challenging problem to try and visualize policies, basically, right? Because they are starting in different points. Um, what we've seen, you know, there's some evidence, you know, when we look at these that when it's, you know, when we're looking at less textured regions and then to more texture is discovered, it starts guiding towards those, you know, or like we know elevation, so really the choice has more to do, you know, that's known, so it's perfectly capable of learning to look towards the horizon, for example, um, but then trying to find like interesting spots. There's hints of that. We haven't yet come up with a really great systematic way, I think, to visualize, for example, as you suggested, category dependent policies, just because they are, you know, they are varied and they are varied per the instance. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I wonder how, uh, how good is your system at uh, separating out uh, basically similar sounds from two different sources, but which sound pretty close yeah. to each other? Very hard for our approach, yeah. So if you have, for example, two violins playing together, because, because of the fact that they sound similar and the fact that we're not nicely representing motion yet, these would be really hard for us to separate. I was thinking more along the lines of a violin and a viola, which, can, which, are, which are, sound similar, but also sound different in other, also in a way. That's what I was more asking. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, the more the frequency differences are exhibited, then the better we'd be for that. I think the things that'll make us better for such cases, either violin viola or violin violin, will be better representation of motion. Because right now we're really doing things a lot on appearance. Like we know how to detect the instrument, so we're expecting certain sounds to kind of retrieve our sound model for violin. But you can do things, and other groups are. Um, there's recent papers, for example, I, for example, Andrew Owen's paper looking at um, learning when things are synchronized or not. Also, my colleague at Facebook, Lorenzo. Um, Tarsani has some work looking at this element of synchronization as a training signal, which really forces you to get specific about motion. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question about the, the back to the gaze policy learning stuff. Yeah. Um, did you look at all about how the, fun, uh, as a function of the sensor, did you learn any sort of like different policy? Like if you have, if you don't constrain the size of it, or if you like blur things, you know, like our retinas have, you know, phobia. Yeah. When, did the policy vary at all? Did you look at this? If you did, not in a systematic way. Um, I mean, we had some intuitions about, you know, because we have to, I think, you know, one element you mentioned is kind of the size of the field of view, and so the tiling of that 360 and even to the extent they overlap, I mean, we can go both ways. We sort of expect that the smaller they are, maybe the more intelligent you have to be to make active intelligent motions, maybe the more you see at once, <coughs> there's less ambiguity. Um, the blurriness, this is a great thing that sh we should implement. For example, you could have the whole model but make it a foveated model, where when you look somewhere you get more um, high-res information here and then it blurs out to the periphery. Haven't implemented that yet, but would, would like to and see if we could, you know, would our agent learn the kind of behavior that scientists know about, say, a human agent doing this kind of look around. Yeah. Are you able to determine the surface uh, properties from learning um, what the agent can do? For example, what's hot, what's cold, what's hard, what's soft? Have you considered those, uh, the properties of the objects? Ah, okay. The agent? So some touch-based properties for it. Yeah. Yeah. Not in our work, no. Um, but I've seen things happening, for example, um, People using the gel site sensor to feel shape of objects in these vibe sessions, like the groups at Berkeley are doing a bunch of things with this. But yeah, in this we don't have touch. We have um, sight and sound at this moment. Yeah. 
and action. The temperature is a great one. I haven't seen that one at all. Ha have you? Have you seen? No, it yeah. just came to me as it would be very helpful. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.